So, um, again, uh, thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, my name is Sevan. Um, I'm going to give a talk um, about um, going from source to OS with NetBSD. Um, so let's get started. Um, in London, uh, we have a hardware uh, group uh, called uh, Open Source Hardware User Group, which is um, oriented around um, open hardware and we have various workshops and um, talks um, around that theme. Um, I was asked to give a presentation uh, about uh, the BSD family of operating systems and from there uh, moved on to being asked to give um, a workshop uh, to introduce this to um, hardware enthusiasts. Now, I'm not uh, a teacher of any sort, and um, I thought it would be a bit much if I tried to cover multiple operating systems. Um, and I decided to settle on um, NetBSD uh, to cover as an introductory OS. Uh, so this is, uh, how, this is how the, uh, the project came about. Um, so when I was thinking about the angle to kind of uh, approach uh, to make uh, NetBSD appealing, uh, I went back a, a few years earlier where we'd run an event called uh, Chip Hack, which was a workshop uh, to introduce uh, VHDL uh, programming, F FPGA programming. Um, and this was using the, uh, an entry level board which you can get from Altera called the DE0 Nano. <clears throat> and the, the reason this event kind of stuck in my mind was basically the first, uh, it was a run, run over a weekend and the first day was just this uh, disaster um, of being a victim of this kind of closed uh, tool chain that you have to use um, in order to get started. And how this was a disaster was that you had this huge download and what most of us didn't know is that there was two versions of it. There's a there's one for the free users, um, and there's one which is a licensed feature user, uh, a licensed fe feature version. Um, but they're both identical in size, and I think possibly the file name. But uh, what ended up happen happening is um, those of us uh, who tried to get ahead um, had downloaded the wrong version, and those who hadn't. Um, ended up losing a lot of time uh, trying to install this toolchain because it was a 12 gigabyte download um, and it installed into something uh, a lot bigger. Um, and those of us who'd installed the wrong version uh, basically didn't get to find out until you go to the final step where you want to actually synthesize your bitstream and it turns around and goes, hey, where's your license information? And that's it. you have to uninstall and start back, back again. So. Uh, between those two uh, two events, most of the day was kind of the first day was wasted, um, uh, and actually this is back in 2013, um, and even like in 2017 with Xilinux, you know, 60 plus gigabytes now uh, of uh, disk space just for like a toolchain uh, to install, um, or I think this was like a couple of weeks ago again. 12 plus gigabytes. So saving time, I think, is a pretty universal angle that you can kind of make things um, appealing for people. So I kind of uh, try to approach it that way. Um, some of the guys who actually attended the original 2013 uh, workshop ended up uh, going a different route as well to kind of try and approach, uh, uh, tackle this problem of um, bad hardware uh, tied with bad software. Um, so they decide they decide this um, open hardware board, um, which uses an open source toolchain as well, and you, you kind of sidestep this problem with kind of large toolchains um, and uh, save yourself a whole load of time uh, learning something new. Um, so what I wanted to do was uh, raise people's expectations that actually not all software is like this and actually some things uh, have a little bit more uh, care and thought um, about, uh, about them. And uh, tr trying to uh, refine this process, it was an exercise for me to kind of become familiar with the system and feed changes back into NetBSD um, to improve things. Uh, 
Do we have any folks here who would consider themselves system folks? A uh, couple of people. Uh, by systems folks, obviously I meant um, people who know HTML, CSS, jQuery, <laughs> uh, REST. Uh, anybody embrace DevOps culture? Uh, one person. Uh, any COBOL in your DevOps culture? <laughs> uh, so... <laughs> So there's a lot of mixed messages. If, you do, if you're not, uh, if you're just starting out, uh, it's quite easy to kind of get led astray into um, into COBOL DevOps land, I guess, on ZOS. Uh, and there's also this problem of, you know, there's, there's quite a steep learning curve. Um, and even if you did end up, you know, just reading this text, doesn't mean that you're going to be anywhere proficient um, into doing something um, serious. Thanks to our age, we, we do have a lot of resources available, but still, it's kind of as your introductory workshop, you know, let's kind of uh, cram through uh, K&R and then a bit of design and implementation is not exactly the uh, easiest of starting things. But it's there, but I wanted to kind of go the other way, which is um, doing something extremely pr practical and uh, just to kind of raise the expectations of people. Um, so in the case of uh, trying to save time, uh, in, in most people, the, 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 the tooling that they have to kind of suffer, uh, it, because it's quite uh, brittle, uh, being able to detect things in a timely manner is, uh, is quite hard. So um, as an example, uh, uh, has everyone seen like uh, the shouting in the data center video uh, from Brendan Gregg? Um, I'll show that at the end, uh, but you know it's it's approaching ten years um, uh, in December, and I think it's still the idea of having a, a mechanism where you can instrument your system in real time is still uh, completely beyond what people um, have at their fingertips um, on a day to day basis when they're working um, uh, another Another one which is a quite interesting idea, uh, Brett Victor talking about uh, how your tooling uh, restrains your ability to kind of explore ideas uh, in that uh, if it's taken a lot, of, uh, it, a lot of time to make iterations, uh, it, you kind of, when you're in the moment, it's quite hard to kind of keep that momentum going because uh, by the time you come to try something new, um, you've, uh, you've lost uh, some of the idea that was kind of going on in your head because it took you so much time to kind of rebuild and restart. Um, and kind of continuing on that theme, um, Brian Cantrell's uh, talk from Lisa 2009 about how D-Trace came about. Um, in this case, before they had D-Trace, uh, trying to debug a production problem uh, with the Sun E10K where you have a crash, uh, your system goes down, by the time it's fully operational again, it's 45 minutes. Um, so when you're trying to uh, iterate on a on a problem uh, with a 45 minute uh, gap, it's a it's a quite a hard thing to kind of uh, realize where the cause and effects are. Um, uh, well, uh, an interesting uh, thing that's also from um, uh, Brett Victor. Uh, it's a project that's going on at the moment called Dynamic Land, which is. Uh, bringing uh, computers uh, to the home and making it a dynamic environment that you can interact with. Um, if you have an internet connect, if your internet connection is working, I highly recommend checking out some of the videos of what they're actually trying to do uh, with that. Um, the reason I'm uh, kind of bringing this up is uh, in terms of what people are actually doing on the flip side of this for like embedded programming and embedded hardware is, a, is in a completely di different league and not for the, uh, for the better. And yeah, uh, people losing time all over the place, uh, whether they're doing imbe embedded programming or um, just anything to do with software, basically. Uh, so, and this kind of continue, uh, continuing down this line, um, 
you have you know uh, people who are kind of scared of their uh, systems. Uh, I would previ in previous times when I was making this, uh, giving this talk, I would always kind of refer back to um, Windows, but I guess now also with Mac OS now as well, uh, you know your system goes down. Uh, you're going to be down for about 20 to 30 minutes. Um, I think with like the latest uh, Mac OS update, there's actually also there's a firmware update, which means that when your machine comes back up, it makes a different noise to the usual. So there's this like moment of panic of have I just bricked my machine or not? Um, uh, or you're dealing with software that doesn't do like proper um, project management. Uh, if you update, are you just getting a bug fix, or are you actually getting um, you know, a whole bunch of changes? Is your software going to behave differently? So that ends up kind of manifesting into uh, you know, fear to kind of explore anything. Can we try this new version? No, because we don't know what's going to what's going to break or not, because you probably don't have test suites or um, you don't know what's happened. Um, and I guess uh, this is more for like kind of people who deal with. Uh, uh, hardware appliances, uh, you know, you, there's no room to kind of maneuver, right? There's uh, light redundancy was a licensed feature, and you don't have that license. So can you explore? Can you try something? Uh, maybe not. Best le leave it as is. Um, so continuing down that line again, uh, people turn around and kind of come up with kind of counterculture solutions. Um, so obviously, you know, your systems. Are causing too much problems, you need to go serverless. Um, get rid of the servers. Uh, Unikernels, you know, obviously your operating system is the problem, so if we do away with the kernel, um, you're going to save yourself a whole bunch of problems. Your operation teams is the problem. Get rid of the operation and <laughs> empower the developers. Uh, or this, I have, this only showed up briefly, but obviously have an operating system with no kernel because obviously everything is in user space. Your problems are all solved. Uh, two interesting papers which kind of uh, attack these uh, things are actually from our community. Uh, first one was uh, George Neville Neal, and the second one is uh, PHK. Um, quite, quite good. Um, do we know what the streetlight anti uh, methodology is? Uh, I think uh, uh, Brendan Gregg uh, talking about the different debug methodologies. Uh, so the anti light methodology is uh, you know so a policeman's walking uh, along the road and he finds this guy looking under the sun uh, uh, street light um, and he asks the guy what he's doing. He's gone. I'm, I'm, uh, I've lost my keys. Uh, so I'm looking for it. And he goes, is this where you last saw it? He goes, no, but this is the brightest place that I can look. <laughs> um, and you kind of see this with systems problems, right? It's, uh, you know, how do I stop the music from playing? Oh, obviously, you know, you reboot the system, right? <laughs> like drastic measures. Uh, so uh, what you want to do is kind of uh, have uh, controlled processes in place so you can explore ideas and try things out. Um, and not be doing things at the seat of the pants, um, and we'll kind of get to that. So what did we cover in these workshops? Um, also, what, what, what are we going to do? So how do you make someone's life easier who's not interested in software? So we're not going to kind of go into um, internal uh, details, kind of very high level, uh, and show how you can be productive without having to get buried down in technical details um, and make some progress. Uh, so how? Explore documentation. Um, for most people um, who are not used to uh, uh, projects with uh, documentation, um, which is part of the project, the first port of call when they have a problem is they kind of hit the search engines. And from the search engines, they kind of uh, go off on a tangent from there. Um, whereas actually, in our case, what you actually want to do is look at the operating system documentation and then see what's missing from there and then uh, uh, dig down further. Um, uh, the relevance of this is uh, that uh, between uh, our source repositories uh, as the BSDs collectively um, and the archives, we can actually trace things back up to uh, 40 years uh, of time. 
which is a lot, lot more than can be said for uh, some other projects. Um, and there's also this um, split or dichotomy between uh, software projects. Either people have just a source repo, like one hosted on GitHub, and under the infrastructure, or on the flip side of that, where they have a website, but you don't necessarily have access to source. And it's not a choice of one or the other. You really need both infrastructure in place to actually be able to kind of debug problems and um, drill down into the, uh, to, to learn about the origins of things. Uh, Cross-compilation in NetBSD has been around for a, a, a long, long time, and uh, it's, it really is uh, dead simple. So I wanted to kind of show that um, you can do that. And it's literally a, a three-step process of fetch the archive, run a command to build your tool chain, um, and then start uh, building uh, systems, um, or building kernels or components of the operating system, which is not necessarily the case for other people. And it's, sometimes it's even a quite a heavy-handed approach just to kind of get built up um, with the cross-compilation environment. Um, <coughs> So if you want to kind of uh, mess around with the system, you're going to have to learn C. But you don't have to learn C. Uh, you, if you have a high-level interface to the system, you can uh, do things uh, and uh, drill down from there. So in our case for NetBSD, um, we have Lua in base as standard and uh, the various bindings to uh, parts of the system. So. The nice thing about this is, is that it's, uh, the syntax of it is very, uh, very high level and very clean. So uh, it becomes very intent driven. You don't have to deal with a lot of boilerplate code and explain a lot of things. Um, and depending on the binding in question, uh, it can be fairly simple to do something that would be otherwise quite difficult. Um, this feature isn't in um, NetBSD yet, but um, as, an, uh, as an example, for ZFS, there's a feature called um, uh, channel, uh, channel Programs, I think. Um, yeah, uh, which is basically a Lua binding for ZFS. So rather than having to write C to uh, change the behavior of the um, uh, file system or perform <coughs> file system operations, you can write um, Lua and um, be done with it. The benefit of this is that uh, you can give the task to somebody who may not be uh, familiar with the internals of ZFS, and they can get up to scratch in doing uh, manipulating the file system fairly easily. Um, in uh, for our case, like uh, doing something with crypto, um, we have bindings for like NetPGP now. So uh, delegating that task to somebody who's not a, a proficient software developer. Uh, to do something with cryptography and try to get it right um, as a first time uh, is a tall ask. Well, with Lua, at least I can make the mistake once and then propagate that all the way down to multiple users uh, through a binding. Um, and in most of these cases, you know, the single board computers, it's the low power um, in not only in power consumption, but in performance as well. So you really don't want to kind of uh, do too much work on there. You, it's kind of like the last step um, thing. Oh, whoa. <laughs> uh, I wanted to kind of defer that as the last step thing. Um, so uh, kind of exploring the rump kernel, uh, which allows you to instantiate a NetBSD kernel in user space and um, explore. The other thing was, was that I didn't want to kind of give out a lot of hardware to kind of people, uh, uh, for people to kind of um, uh, use. So I, I was relying on what was available on the boards. And in terms of the peripherals that are kind of user controllable in, um, and say like, like a Raspberry Pi is very little. Uh, so we were going to do something as trivial as manipulating the LEDs uh, using Lua. Um, and the only thing that you have is one LED, which is your Ethernet activity light. Um, so that, that was kind of a segue to <coughs> ignore the actual hardware and what you actually have available and use simulation devices instead. So for in this case, we have a GPIO um, simulation device, which gives you 60 pins, which you can manipulate. 
and you can uh, kind of drill down from there using um, using Lua. Uh, and how rich is your operating system in terms of the functionality that avail is available out of the box? So security is a fairly uh, important topic and growing more in, uh, important every day, especially in the embedded space. Uh, so being able to kind of deal with uh, compromised systems, uh, how do you prevent a modified binary from executing? Uh, and we have very exec, which um, allows you to, th to do that out of the box. Uh, and the response from that was really good uh, because it's, it's really trivial to kind of see uh, you, like, uh, the, the example that we ended up using was, you know, you run something like ls um, and then you would modify the ls by, you know, echo zero into your binary and then try and execute it again and your system prevents you from uh, being able to do that. Um, and the person doesn't have to think about uh, how the internals of the working unit, this is a fairly instant way of realizing how the, the functionality uh, works. Uh, but it was far from uh, smooth sailing. Uh, there, wasn't, uh, there wasn't too many Windows uh, users. I think like uh, well, the first time that we'd end up with the workshop, we had a, a person who turned up with a, a copy of Windows 10, but it was like an early build. Um, and the, this Windows subsystem for Linux wasn't um, there as standard. So, for some reason, I don't know, uh, when you turn around and say, I want to enroll on the beta program, Microsoft would kind of delay things for like 24 hours before the updates would become available, which by that point, <laughs> the workshop is long, long finished. And um, So that was one example. Another person turned up with like a Surface tablet, and they had all sorts of problems with like Windows 10 and Symlinks. So they thought, I'll try VirtualBox, at which point their system started rebooting. Um, so I haven't explored the Windows side too much, but it was mainly attendees were like on Macs and Linux. Uh, for Linux, um, the other thing I wanted to do was I wanted to kind of avoid explaining networking to people. So it was bring a serial adapter and we'll kind of uh, work off the, the console. Uh, for Linux, uh, we, I kind of had to explain what UUCP was, which was a, a segue that was kind of uh, not necessary. Um, depending on the adapter, that could be worse for uh, Mac OS, um, <clears throat> especially so now with the latest version uh, with, the, with the way that they enforce uh, signed kernel extensions uh, where you have to allow things from system preferences and that doesn't always work. So you're sitting there just uh, pressing things over and over again. Um, and I'll actually come back to this another example. Um, the other one was uh, Fallout from Clang, which is now fixed, which was the C++ code we have for like GCC. Um, Clang would not allow you to kind of compile something which exceeds 512 levels of indirection uh, in depth. Uh, and yeah. Does anyone know what that model, the CH340G uh, serial adapter is? Uh, it's a uh, serial controller that's uh, manufactured by a Chinese vendor uh, but and it's really cheap to kind of pick up but they I don't think the vendor kind of envisaged uh, selling outside of China so the original um, website is Chinese the driver is Chinese and the community has kind of stepped in to kind of help that help out so if you search for this um, on your search engine, you will get, depending on the filter bubble that you're in, uh, someone's blog post. And uh, depending on how old that blog post is, depends on how old the driver you're going to get. So for Mac OS, uh, it could be that you have an unsigned driver um, and you will try and install that, and Mac OS will stop you. So you will commonly search for things, and then someone will turn around and go, oh, you need to turn off kernel ex signed extensions so the driver will load. Um, and literally, we had this problem at the London hack space where somebody uh, ha was halfway through kind of mutilating their operating system just to get the serial port to kind of load. And um, for Windows, it's something quite, quite drastic as well. Um, so really want to kind of do away with this as well um, and not rely on serial adapters either. Um, 
another weird one, which is like from the relic of the DOS days. Why do you need to have like kind of DOS partitions um, uh, marked bootable for an ARM board, um, so it would boot from the correct media? Uh, but it's a thing, and it's made it through into like the Beaglebone Black. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, does anyone know what the Lunatic Project is? Uh, so. Uh, the idea of kind of scriptable operating systems and um, bringing Lua to your operating system and making it scriptable so you have this high level interface to explore the system um, and uh, not have to delve down into C. Uh, so w uh, we now have uh, like Lua bindings for like NetPGP, so you can do crypto using Lua. Uh, we have a binding for the Bozo web server. So you can, do, uh, you can instantiate a, a web server from user space. And currently in the works, we also have a Unix um, binding, which gives you kind of in, uh, interfaces to like system calls and um, uh, libc functions uh, from Lua. The idea of this is for, uh, possibly for the next uh, iteration is doing something quite complex, which would be quite difficult to do in C uh, using Lua and actually delegating that to the attendees. Um, I'm thinking maybe perhaps like do a CA, um, so setting up a CA from scratch. Um, it's a bit software oriented, but it's just to kind of demonstrate the idea of um, how you can do something quite difficult um, and not, um, not be 100% uh, competent in the, in the code base. Uh, so we have uh, Bonjour or Multicast DNS enabled. Um, so I think uh, for the next iteration, we're going to actually end up using that instead uh, because it will be easy to kind of find the devices and I don't have to explain uh, how to do networking 101 uh, with the systems. Uh, bring in some more testing th uh, uh, frameworks. Um, so we, we, we have the ability to kind of instantiate um, a NetBSD image from user space, run through a test suite, and tear things down, um, and that it, that's available regardless of the platform you're on. So, a, a good demonstration of um, software development, uh, and also the ability to. Uh, one, the other thing was was actually the, being able to kind of log in. We don't at the moment the, the ARM images that we provide uh, do not have any default users available, uh, which kind of makes it difficult trying to. Uh, log in over the network because there's no user, so uh, how are you going to break in? Um, so for the, uh, what, we're gonna, what I'm going to do for the next one is basically have a script which will read a text file from the DOS partition, uh, which will have a username inside, uh, which the user can set, and from that uh, set, create a new user account, so which will allow you to um, log in over the network. Um, Ideally, what I want to do is actually have a, a booklet or pamphlet um, that can be used for wider distribution um, for people to kind of try things out. Uh, at the moment, it's based around the workshops that I'm running. Um, and yeah, m more, Lua, um, more Lua and Rump examples. Uh, the next workshop is going to be in, um, in Lincoln, uh, beginning of next month. Um, and uh, I developed the, the workshop in the London Hackspace and uh, yeah, ran the workshops at, uh, in London. Um, any questions? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so let me show you the, um, the things that are meant uh, in
I'll show you the Brett Victor uh, talk as well. So in this case, what he's uh, talking about is like how uh, having a, um, a, a re really rigid, uh, rigid um, environment to work in kind of inhibits your ability to kind of explore ideas. So um, having an, uh, an idea, uh, sorry, having an environment where you can uh, freely uh, explore and try things out uh, kind of really uh, affects the, your ability to kind of uh, uh, try things out. So. In this case, he's got this kind of proof of concept uh, platform game. And what he's trying to do is, um, you know, the character kind of jumps down, and then from there is kind of supposed to end up over here. Uh, and if you think about how you would kind of do that in your normal everyday um, uh, environment, you know, you, you would set some value, um, compile, uh, try it, it didn't work, and then go back and do that. And if it's some monster of a code base, uh, you're losing time. And now when I move it forward, it's going to simulate forward using the same input controls, the same keyboard commands that we told us before. Let's do the code. Right. It's nice that I can be walked backwards. And these are all ideas I can use for other enemies, but um, I think turtles are supposed to be slow. So that's a good excuse for a turtle. And then up here, I've got some code that says, when my guy collides with the turtle, he gets some y velocity, so he bounces into the air, and the turtle gets stomped. So that looks like that. And the turtle gets up after a bit. The problem is, I don't want the player to be able to get up here yet. I want the player to bounce off the turtle and go through this little passageway down here. And I'll have to go around and you know, solve puzzles and whatnot, come back and get the star. So the turtle's too bouncy right now. Now, of course, I can just turn that down in the code, and now I can try it, but now it's not bouncy enough. And so while it's nice that I can you know, adjust the code while it's running, instead of having to stop and recompile and find my place again, I can't immediately see what I need to see, which is whether or not you can make that jump. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bounce off the turtle and pause the game. So I pause the game, and now there's a slider up here, which lets me rewind through time. And now I can rewind to back before I made the jump and change the code to make it less bouncy. And now when I move it forward, it's going to simulate forward using the same input controls, the same keyboard commands that recorded as before, but the new code. This is not good enough. I need to be able to see changes immediately. I need to be able to see immediately whether or not my bounciness is correct. None of this stuff. And if you have a process of time and you want to see changes immediately, you have to map time and space. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bounce off my turtle, pause the game, and now hit this button here which shows my guy's trail. So now I can see where he's been. And when I rewind, this trail in front of him is where he's going to be. This is his future. And when I change the code, I change his future. So I can find exactly the value I need. So when I hit play, he slips right in there. Yeah. Uh, so if you look at that and like uh, the tools that we end up having to kind of suffer on a day-to-day -day basis, um, uh, uh, for NetBSD, like uh, we actually ended up starting to bring in things like from the Dtrace toolkit, enabling things from out of the box. So you can turn around and do things like uh, you know run IO snoop, not IO snoop, um, exec snoop. You know, so in real time you can see you know when I type man on the command prompt. 
what actually what processes is that um, executing? Um, and hopefully maybe uh, raise folks' uh, expectations. Thank you.